And in all the work that I've done now, both in myself and with the hundreds of high performers and entrepreneurs that we've helped over the last decade, it, it's, it really always comes down to one thing. And that one thing is the trash from your past. Because typically, treasure is also formed within all that trash pressure in those same moments that formed the trash. It doesn't matter what age we're at. It doesn't matter what place we are in our life. What if we feel like sunk costs, like so much time has passed? So I believe that every single breath and every single moment is a new moment to refresh, refine, and grow. I tell you it's never too late. The question is, if you've given up on yourself at a young age, you have to start to question, like, what is the value and the quality of life I'm going to exist in for however much longer I live. You're listening to the Real Business Connections Network. Real Business Connections Network. Powered, powered, powered by Balbert Marketing, LLC. Subscribe now and check us out at realbusinessconnections.com. Enjoy the show. Welcome, everyone, once again to Learn, Speak, Teach on the Real Business Connections Network. I'm here for round two with Brian Bogert. Brian, what's up, brother? How are you? Dude, I just I just so appreciate who you are. And I love every time I get to be in your presence, whether it's in our community or you and I are catching up or we're creating content together or I'm just watching you from afar, brother. So it's uh, I'm excited as well. Dude, and and as a disclaimer, I usually tell people uh, my guests before this, and any audience member probably notices, I usually keep a cheat sheet on both sides of me. So if anyone's watching the video, they'll see me like reading a bio on the right side. That's my cheat sheet. I learned this from you. I came with a blank sheet of paper. I wrote down two things, Brian. I wrote down Brian Boger, which I don't know why I had to write that down. I know your name, and I wrote down. <laughs> LST number six. So this segment of the show, you are the sixth episode. I just replayed it on the podcast, um, but I wanted to shout out LST number six is where we kind of started this conversation. Other than that, man, I got a blank page and kind of just want to have a conversation with you. So if someone dived in and didn't listen to part one, give us the short version on just who Brian Bogert is. Yeah, great question. I'm a husband and father first, and it's the only thing binary in my world. So if my wife and my kids aren't good, I walked away from everything else. Outside of that, I would tell you that I was a lost individual who's had to do a lot of digging and shedding of a lot of layers and armor in my life to get back to the core of who I really am, which is a curious individual who's fascinated by the human experience and human connection at the deepest level. I genuinely love to ask the questions that don't often get asked. I I have natural wonder, but part of that armor shut off all of my creativity and all of my connection ability over the years. And I've spent the last 12 years starting to unpack that to better understand myself, align and live in a congruent way. But I would tell you that I operate with a lot of heart. I feel a lot and I love a lot. And the more I can lean into that, the more everything in my life seems to flow and the deeper my relationships and connections go. And that's exactly why I came with this blank page, Brian, because you taught me this. If we can share this moment together, have a conversation, unpack some of this, I think we can really help some people. And a, a new thing you've been doing, you know, flipping the lid. I like the metaphor, yeah. unpacking, taking out the trash. Well, what, what's that mean on flipping the lid, taking out the trash? <laughs> so I, I genuinely believe that most people are stuck for reasons that they don't know, believe, and isn't being talked about. Most people believe they're stuck because they have the wrong strategy, tactics, or systems in their life or business, right? They've reached a pinnacle of growth. They're no longer scaling. They're no longer connecting. They're whatever. And well, it's because I have the wrong coach or I have the wrong selling system or I have the wrong software or technology or man, I'm not making enough money yet, right? And the reality of it is those things are critically important, my friend, but they are never what keep people stuck. And in all the work that I've done now, both in myself and with the hundreds of high performers and entrepreneurs that we've helped over the last decade, it, it's, it really always comes down to one thing. And that one thing is the trash from your past. 
Now, as soon as I say that, people are like, what? What? What are you, what are you talking about? Well, what is the trash? Trash are those unpacked or unprocessed moments that have created intellectual or emotional beliefs about yourself that cause you to react in moments that have nothing to do with what's right in front of you. There are those situations and things like when my wife would ask me, hey, honey, what are we going to do with the kids this weekend? But my shame trash would cause me to hear it this way. Hey, honey, you've not done enough to be a good husband and father here recently. So what are you going to do to make up for it this weekend? And then I'd react and rattle off the 10 things I've done in the last four days to show her I'm a good husband and father when that wasn't even what she asked. It's those moments that you load the dishwasher incorrectly and your spouse says something to you and it has nothing to do with your spouse, nothing to do with the dishwasher and everything to do with how your grandpa looked at you when you're four. Okay. Now I gave two personal examples, but this permeates into business and everything because the trash from your past are those things that you've buried, you've shut down, you've put away, you've put on a proverbial box up in the corner and you've tried to avoid or ignore it your whole life, yet it continues to come back as your fatal flaw. Your biggest problems in business, relationships in life, it could be scarcity, it could be perfectionism and control, it could be guilt, it could be a whole variety of other things and how it shows up in your world that's preventing you from living in alignment with who you are and the life that you want to live. And so this concept of flipping the lid, there's it's actually flip the lid is one of the pillars that we walk through in teaching the waste to wealth method. But flipping the lid means literally just that. Flip open your own lid and take a look inside and see what's risen to the top, objectively and non-judgmentally. Lay it out in the light and ask yourself those questions like, what am I feeling right now? Like, what is it connected to? Where is it showing up in my body? Better understanding where and why I got triggered. Flipping the lid is the same concept as scanning the can as well. And it's done in two moments. That one moment could be something similar to where my wife now says something to me. And if I feel the trigger, I can flip my lid real time. And I can literally say to her, babe, I just felt myself get triggered, which told me I didn't hear you correctly. So could you please restate it a different way or repeat yourself? And I'll try to hear it through a more neutral lens. And if I can't, maybe we can pause this and revisit it later. What have I done now? I've taken awareness, ownership. I've unpacked because I've done the work. I've known how those emotions move through my body. And real time in the moment, I've prevented a reaction that would create damage, creating the need for me to expend additional energy creating repair. Flipping the lid can also be at the end of the day. We all take trash out in our businesses and our lives daily. Because if we don't, it starts to get stinky. The bag gets heavy or too full. It starts overflowing. Yet we'll get these low frequency interactions, these moments that we feel unworthy, defeated, right? Deflated completely, disconnected, misunderstood, not seen and understood, not protected, not connected, right? Like we all experience these through the day. Somebody looks at us funny and all of a sudden we're like, what did I do wrong, right? And that's all trash from our past. But the reality of it is it's what we're reacting to in the moment, which typically has nothing to do with what's right in front of us. That's the trash. And the trash will continue to come back in your business, in your life, in your relationships, and in your health at the deepest level. And so I'm just so clear now that it doesn't have to be that way because typically treasure is also formed within all that trash pressure in those same moments that formed the trash. Some of your greatest skill sets are going to exist in that same developmental moment, but it's about understanding our intellectual and emotional narratives so we can better understand ourselves and better show up in the world. Because here's the reality. And I want to say this before I say anything else on trash so that everybody hears this clear. The trash from your past is not your fault. It just becomes your responsibility once you become aware of it or you start burying others in yours. But these are generationally patterned, environmentally conditioned, literally cellularly inherited. It's no wonder why I had anger issues while my dad had anger issues. It's not the only reason I have them. I had to unpack all that stuff. But what did I learn? I learned a model for how to protect myself through aggression and pushing everybody away when that's actually exactly opposite of what I want to do in my life. Let's double down on this. Answer this question, if you don't mind, because there's there's the adage that's by now kind of cliche that all that stuff happened for me, not to me. And mm -hmm. I've learned how to become resilient, have grit, have grind. I'm tremendously successful. My family's happy. I feel fulfilled. I don't have trash, Brian. What are your thoughts and scenarios like that? Someone could be a very high performer and yeah. truly feel that way. Do yeah. they have trash, Brian? So I have yet to meet a human being who doesn't have trash. <laughs> like, if someone genuinely doesn't have trash and they can come to me 
you also know me well enough to know that that's like one of my abilities. I seem to have like x-ray vision to be able to look through someone's <laughs> armor and see what's inside. And so I see the trash, whether they choose to admit it or not. So I, I guess I'll throw that as a challenge. If anybody really is like, no, I don't have trash, don't have any of it, never came. I, I just welcome the opportunity to have a conversation with you and then we'll see where it goes. But but what I say in reflection to that for most people, okay? Uh, because that's that's a little challenging. That's a little like uh, you know cheeky even in the way I respond to that. But yeah. What I always say for those who question, do I have trash? If you feel anything in response to the question I'm about to ask you, I can almost guarantee you have trash. Who was the last person that made you feel like garbage? And you don't have to answer this, Ben, obviously for the sake of this, but I have yet to meet someone who, when they actually sit with that, doesn't have some low frequency energy or emotion around someone that made them feel less than, right? However you define less than. And that to me is trash and garbage and it's a low frequency energy, which means that there's still cellular memory in your body that's protecting something that may or may not actually be real. And so awareness is the first pillar that we always talk about because the reality of it is, is until we can see something, until we're aware of it, we can't be intentional with it. But the number one thing, and that's why I gave the disclaimer that it's not your fault, it's your responsibility, right. is because so often self-awareness is tightly paired with higher self-judgment. People just become more aware of all the ways they should be judging themselves rather than knowing what to do about it or how to interpret it and how to recreate those patterns and cellular memories. So if we know that, and we know that that's not the case, then awareness is not simply becoming more aware of all the ways we should be judging ourselves, but having more clarity into how we show up in certain moments, the way that we feel, the intellectual and emotional narratives that were formed in those moments, how those have been demonstrated as actions so that we can better see and understand ourselves and show up with more ownership in each moment. Mm. So I like talking to you, Brian. So I've, we, all, we all flip the lid when we answer that question. Like, who is the mm -hmm. last person that made me feel like garbage? There's kind of an open loop there. So once we have an answer to that, everyone who's listening has someone in their head, I imagine. Mm -hmm. What do we do next? So the very next question that I do to follow that, and I, you know, I'm going to weave in the pillars throughout because we just talked about the flip the little minute ago. I gave you awareness, but the really cool part is, is our pillars are not linear. They're more like yeah. an infinity that weave in and out of each other. So it doesn't really matter when we talk about them as long as we understand them all. Um, the very next question, and I'm not going to put this into a position of a pillar yet, but almost always when someone says, oh, this person, or even if it's yourself, because that's also a very common answer. I was the last person that made myself feel like garbage. Oof. By the way, that means you also have trash, right? And so then it's, how does that feel in your body? Now, what I want to be clear on with this is that 99% of people are going to instinctually answer in one of two ways. They're either gonna, either gonna label an emotion or they're gonna labor a, la label a physical feeling that often can be described as an external, right? So man, I'm, I'm feeling anxious, I'm feeling stressed, I'm feeling shameful, I'm feeling guilty, or I'm feeling heavy, I'm feeling disconnected, I'm feeling, right? It's more a description about how they're perceiving themselves in the external world but versus how it actually feels in their body, okay? So 99% of people answer with one of those things. It's not bad. By the way, I'm happy if you know the answer to both those questions. But what I'm trying to get to is how does it physiologically show up in your body? Right? What happens with your heart rate? What happens with your respiration rate? Do you get tension anywhere? Do you feel your jaw lock up? Do you feel a knot in your throat? Do you feel, right, like your, your armor starting to come up? Do you feel your blood rush through your body with that wave of heat that some of us who have been at anger can associate and understand? Like, until you know the physiological pattern of what's happening in your body, you can't separate yourself from the moment. Because it's so deep, it's so cellular. And what we know is that there are 40,000 brain-like cells in the heart that are called sensory neurites. And what they've actually shown is that they carry the same level of cellular type memory that our brains do in certain ways. That's why they're called brain-like cells. But what they've also shown is if you go to therapy, for example, and you just intellectually talk about the patterns of your past, and you don't find a way to penetrate the head to heart connection and really embody it and feel the associated emotions to process, unpack and understand that those 40,000 cells in your heart don't ever heal, which means that they don't change, which reinforces one of my core lessons. If you don't feel, you won't heal. 
Brian, I want to stop and for it's a really moment. important. Yeah, go ahead. I think what you just said is so important because I even mentioned the all that happened for me. That's intellectualizing that all this stuff happened for me. That's the head, mm-hmm. correct? That's 100% the head. And I think if we're operating simply intellectually alone, we're always operating from a position of armor and protection because it's only part of the narrative. I stopped you. You did. I don't know where I was going with it, but I, that's why I leaned into that. But it, why, why is that so important? Okay, I, I'll, yes. I'll, I'll just give some an example because I think it's really important to center this for those. You know, if somebody hadn't listened to the prior episode, I'll just give the 30,000 foot level because yeah. all of these lessons have come through my own life as well. And what I want to be really clear on before I tell the quick story is I realize how unique my story is, but what I want you to be listening to my story through the lens of is the lessons that I'm associating with it, not the extremity of my story. Because every single one of your stories is important. What's most important, though, is that you learn how to pause long enough to extract those lessons so you can become intentional moving forward. Now, for me, I was seven. I was run over by a truck. My left arm was completely severed from my body, reattached, 24 surgeries, years of adversity. And I won't get into the depth of each window of time and all the core lessons right out of the gate. But but why do I tell you all that? Well, in the most simplistic, abbreviated version of the story, I never even realized this. That when I shut off physical pain because it exceeded my ability to cope, I shut off mental pain, spiritual pain, and emotional pain for 20 to 25 years because I was told if I had a good mindset, if I had mental toughness, right, that I'd be okay. And by the way, I did that very effectively for a long time, but my own narrative ended up biting me, which I've seen happen with lots of other people as well, right? Like, I'm good. I'm strong. I'm capable. I can do anything myself. That was my narrative, but I didn't have the courage to ask for help in my most vulnerable moments, right? And so I was disconnected from myself and disconnected from others because of the self-protection of living up in my head. What I didn't realize until I was 32, brother, was how much I was actively suppressing everything I was feeling. Unconsciously. Didn't even know I was doing it. It was only once I became aware of a deeper level of feeling in a moment with my daughter that I started to realize that everything else paled in comparison. And so if that became the truth, And I had really only ever felt this deep before. I had to continue to be aware long enough to the moment of trigger to try to allow that core natural feeling to actually exist in longer and longer periods of time. Because I had to understand it. I had to sit with it. I had to allow my cells to feel it, associate it with it, process it. And that's in the unpack process, which is one of the other pillars. It's literally giving yourself the ability to feel the feelings, understand what Mm -hmm. they mean, the associated narratives, the associated beliefs about yourself that happened in moments. Because here's the reality. You can treat the symptoms of trash by just closing up the bag and deciding to take it out or closing the lid if you don't want to pay attention to it. It will bite you in the long run, but, but you can't do that forever and escape it. Because until you get to the source or sources of that particular trash, reaction, emotional trigger, you cannot effectively remove it or move through it. And so I had to sit with it and really understand it. When my anger happened, man, I didn't even know I was angry for most of my life. And if I talked to most people in my life, 99% of them were like, what? You're angry? (laughs) But the reality of it is it's because almost all of it came out on my wife and kids. Mm. I created damage with the three people that I care most about and I didn't even know it for a long time because I was operating from the cellular memory of reaction and my nervous system was tapped in fight or flight for 31 years. Mm, I I think a lot of people listening, me especially, I know this for a fact, a lot of this is resonating. Literally just weeks ago, I was going to do an open mic and I had gotten some lunch and I realized I wouldn't be home for three hours. That's too long for it to sit in the hot car. So I had to drive home, put it in the fridge. And the closer I got to home, the more I knew I wasn't going to come back to do the open mic. And then when I went back and got in the door, everyone's like, oh, Brent, nice to see you. I told my friend, like, I literally am like falling out of my skin in anxiety right now. And he said, you seem so calm. I was calm 
but I was still feeling it. And another thing that's is I, I'm ranting, Brian, but one thing that was really interesting is at the time we're recording this, this will come out a little bit later. I just turned 32. That's a funny mm. little connection there. It is. And I'm just recently unpacking and learning some of these things. Happens to be a multiple of, oh, it's not a multiple of eight, is it? Yeah. No, it's not it a is. multiple of eight. It is. Which is cool. Well, 40 is a multiple of eight, so 32 would have to be, right? There you go. That's isn't 40, yeah, because it's 24. Uh, it's five. It's five times eight, isn't it? Yeah. It's 40. No, I don't know. Something like that. Four times eight, 32. We're totally on an inside comment too with the eights. Four times eight. See, and I'm, what's funny is I'm really good with math. And I, for whatever reason, when that came up, it, like what the numbers were not connecting. That's funny. I, yeah, but I, no, it is. It's a multiple of eight. It is. I, I have an actual question, but since we're talking about eights, like people are like, what the heck is it? Why are we talking about eights right now? And then I'll go into the other question. Why are we talking about eights? <laughs> well, I'm going to associate it with the fact that you've got an unbelievable recall and you seem to know the significance of the number eight in my life and in our business. Is that what you're referring to? Just so I yes, know. Yes. Yes. Okay. So um, one of our primary logos was a very intentionally designed logo that is this infinity around this concept of no limits. Okay. Now, the eight is basically an infinity turned upwards, right? For whatever reason, the number four has always been my favorite number. And the number eight has always been my wife's favorite number. Our anniversary happens to be like, there's all these things that are connected to eights in our world. How, like, how is it so hard for us to do four times eight? <laughs> dude, I don't know. Well, and that's, yeah, that, <laughs> I, I really honestly don't know. That's what's so funny because eight is like prevalent. A lot of our pricing models have fours and eights integrated in them because of the way that we just see it. We've got embedded fours and eights and some of our logos and brand cycles that people aren't aware of. I, I love the concept of intentionality. And for whatever reason, fours and eights have always had a pattern. This is what's crazy. My son's birthday was on the 12th, right? My wife's birthday is on the 16th. My daughter's birthday is on the 24th. <laughs> All multiples of four and eight. Now yeah. I'm the oddball out. I'm the 19th, but I think, what is that? A prime number. So yeah. I'm going to call that a win too. But either way, like that's the significance of it. Now you were just referencing it because it's fun and we love to play with numbers and inside stuff. And I want people to get to know you. So the, the question I was on before I went on a tangent here is... I started this around 30, 31, you 32, I'm 32 right now. Doesn't matter what age we're at. Doesn't matter what place we are in our life. What if we feel like sunk costs, like so much time has passed? Is now an okay time to start? Uh, so I believe that every single breath and every single moment is a new moment to refresh, refine, and grow. That's just how I live my life and always have. And so I would tell you it's never too late. The question is, if you've given up on yourself at a young age, you have to start to question, like, what is the value and the quality of life I'm going to exist in for however much longer I live, right? But I will tell you that, like, at our last retreat, for example, the ages ranged from 26 to 60. My oldest client that I've ever worked with one-to-one -one was 78. Right. I've worked with multiple people in their 70s and 60s who are looking at it through the lens of, hey, I've lived this much life. I've had a good life. I've made some money. I've done all these things, but I'm desiring more fulfillment, more connection, more depth for however much longer I live. And that only comes through better understanding yourself and being able to be in each moment more effectively. So I don't think it's ever too late. Here's the reality, though. The longer you wait, the harder it is. Because when I talk about this being conditioned and patterned and literally so at a cellular memory level, every day that passes, every week that passes, every month that passes, every year that passes, every decade that passes, that you're not actively identifying and removing what no longer serves you or mm. transforming it into a wealth generating opportunity for you because of the treasure that it is, every moment, it's going to be harder to unpack the longer you wait. Because let's just call it 32 for you. You have 32 years of conditioning. You can't just flip a light switch and decide, oh, all of a sudden I'm not going to react in all the ways that I always used to. It doesn't happen that way. It happens through persistence, consistence, regularity over time, practicing and refining, understanding of self better. But you have 32 years. The individual who just came to my retreat that's 60 
He has 60 years of patterning, almost double you, right? And that's what the reality of it becomes is, is it impossible the older you get? No, but you have to be even more willing and open and courageous to find your truth because it'll be harder to dig through more trash that you've been carrying a lot longer. A nuance clarity on the amount we're carrying. So you could be 15, 32, 60, 75. If you're on, it's not linear that you're older, you have more trash per se. You can be taking no. this out at any age. For someone like me, I make a lot of mistakes, or at least I feel like I do. So I can take out the trash, but then if I don't keep taking it out, it'll start to build up. So I can do this consistently and still have trash keep on coming into my life, it's, right? It's completely the truth, brother, which is why I, I encourage people to do the flip the lid and scan your can exercise at the end of every day. To just reflect back on the days to the moments that I felt triggered, that I felt that low frequency energy, that I didn't feel the best self, that I didn't like how the person looked at me or I felt taken advantage of or unappreciated. Or We all know what those are because we've all experienced it. I've yet to meet a human being who has not experienced that in any way, right? Even in moments. But the issue is, is when you go to sleep every single night and you get into REM sleep, which is stage three sleep, that's where memory consolidation takes place. Hmm. That's where the cellular memory is created. So your dreams are interpreting and unpacking all of these things. But the reality of it is you're further embedding the memory and the pattern within your body every time you go to sleep after a significant day of trigger without having processed or unpacked anything. So you could do a bunch of digging for the next 10 years and be like, fuck, I've arrived. I don't have to do this work anymore. <laughs> and if you just stop, guess what? They're going to come back. They're, you're going to have adversaries in constant pursuit of you until the day that you die. The trick is reducing the amount of time that we spend in them. So I just told you that I was suppressing feeling and I had to lengthen the amount of time to understand it. But then once I've understood it, now what can I do? I can start compressing it back. You know, I would live in that existing low frequency energy sometimes in my business, in my relationship, even about myself for months or years. But now, it's minutes and moments. It's a it's a small little drop in my day. My unpacking process, my flipping the lens, getting the process every night is easy because I've done enough work now that I really don't get triggered that much anymore. And I can also really start to pay attention to the fact that, okay, in these three or four areas, here's the associated pattern. Here's what it's connected to. Because I've been doing this work consistently, deeply for well over a decade now, right? Even though I told you 32 was the feeling side of it, I had already begun the process of unpacking by age 27 is when I really started, but it was only intellectual still at that point. So every night, flip the lid, scan the can. I've heard the opposite scenario every night, write down five wins. That's yeah. more that, it's more optimistic. That's more like, uh, my concern, if I do that every night, is it going to make me sad? Is it going to make me feel vulnerable? Do I want to go to bed doing it that way? Or do I need to embrace that? Let me, let me be clear when I say this. Just because I say before you go to bed, that doesn't mean you need to do it at bed. Sure. Okay? You can do this in any moment. You can do it in any part of the day. And you could do it at the end of the day as you're in your wind down routine and then give yourself an hour of buffer in between. Mm. The reality of it is, is yes. Sitting in some of these moments, can they make you feel more like garbage and more like trash? Of course they can. But the point is, is only to sit in them long enough until it points you towards what's important, not mm. to sit in them just for the necessary point of feeling like garbage. You're not so again, if we can remain objective and non-judgmental with ourselves, when we're flipping open that lid again, we're, we're looking at everything in the light from the day. It's not judgmental. It's not, I'm not good enough. I, I fucked this up. I fucked that up. It's okay. Let me better understand why I felt the way that I felt, what could I do about it differently? And what are the associated patterns that I've carried forward in my life and business? So I get what you're saying, but I'm also a contrarian in some ways. I, I love the uh, concept of also writing gratitude alongside it, some of the wins alongside it. The point is, is that most people don't ever want to focus on the negative. Yeah. I don't want you to focus on it, perseverate on it, and have that be your sole focus. No. It's about clearing the interference as quickly in your life as you can. So it's not even a factor for you most of the time anymore, right? But what does that take? It takes reps. It takes refining, right? When you go back to the gym after being out of shape for six years, it's going to fucking hurt, right? Like you're going to get sore. You're going to get painful. You're going to get stretched just like this. But 
The other side of the contrarian is I'm also one of those that says we shouldn't just focus on dreams, aspirations, and desires. Most people in goal setting, that's all they focused on, the positive. Sure. Right? But we are as motivated by pain as we are by pleasure. And for me, it's not about putting myself into pain. As you know, we've got the concept of embracing pain to avoid suffering. But what's the very first step in that? We have to acknowledge the suffering we wish to avoid in our lives before we can even understand the pains we need to embrace to move forward. Right? So legitimately acknowledging the suffering I wish to avoid in my life. Well, I, I already told you the only thing binary in my world, a life without my wife and kids would be absolute suffering. So for me, there's nothing in terms of pain that I may have to do in terms of discomfort with myself, conversations I need to have, growth I need to experience that would ever outweigh the amount of suffering that I would experience, right? So I have to understand that. My physical body was a great example. In my early 20s, because of my body, the imbalance, I don't have a lat on the left side of my back. I have a curve in my spine. I don't have a tricep in my left arm. My bicep is my gracilis. My anatomy is different. I have physical pain, right? I had physical pain early. Well, it was getting to the point that it was debilitating in my life, which to me was defined as suffering because it wasn't just the normal aches and pains or I hurt myself playing sports. It's like, no, I'd wake up every day and be a wreck. That's suffering. That's not living. Right. And so for me, if I'm not clear on that and what I'm trying to avoid as well, then I'm only seeing one side of it because the reality of it is, is those are our benchmarks. Those are our bookends, our hopes, our dreams, our desires, but the suffering we wish to avoid. If we don't understand both, we aren't, we actually can't tap into the deepest levels of motivation that we're capable of. Love this, Brian. Goals aren't bad. Gratitude's definitely not bad. I keep a gratitude journal. But if we don't look at these actions, these decisions, these trigger points in the eye, pull the trash out, give it a high five and walk away, yeah, it's just going to continue to build up. So this doesn't have to be something I'm ruminating on for hours affecting my life, but it is something that I need to reflect on when it's required. Yeah. Well, and I mean, look at if you're an entrepreneur or you're a team leader or you're an executive in an organization, again, this applies as much in organizations as it does in individuals, right? If I'm a leader and I get into an almost car accident on the way to the office and I'm not aware of the trigger and the fight or flight that my body's in, it could be associated with any other emotion I've had in the moment where I've been in fight or flight and I'm just rigid and you can feel the palpable energy, right? Or I could have gotten in a fight with my spouse before walking into a team meeting. Right. And then it's like, well, man, we just had that long team meeting. The team didn't seem to understand it. There wasn't really clarity. How come the team never seems to get what I'm trying to tell them? Man, my team can never step up and do what I do. Guess what? Those are all triggers. That's all trash. That's all self protection. Because the reality of it is, is they're feeding directly off of the connection and the energy that exists. Right. You know, my concept on the human experience. I think we all seek and desire four things. And it's important to understand this because this is what our trash prevents. Okay. We all seek and desire to feel safe. We all seek and desire to feel protected. We all seek and desire to feel seen and understood. And we all seek and desire to feel connected. I believe these last two are the two that we want the most, but they don't happen unless the first two do, right? So yeah. what happens when we walk into a room and we don't feel totally seen, understood? We, our boss has passed us up for that promotion. We've, we've been on a performance plan now for a little while. We don't know how to escape it. Or our dad looks at us funny every time we walk in the house. And I've been competing with my sibling for years, right? This is all connected. The second we don't feel safe or protected, seen, understood, or connected, what do we do? Protect ourselves. Because it's natural evolutionary survival. Like it's instinct, right? We protect ourselves. Now, we have that most of the time to protect us in physical safety. Yet, we don't have the ability most times to segment or separate between the physical safety, the emotional safety, the mental safety, and the spiritual safety, which are all important to actually connect and be seen and understood. So the second we protect ourselves, we're actually guaranteeing we'll disconnect ourselves. If you know those 35 gallon black trash bags, you know this analogy and this thing that I do, right? If we hold that out in front of us, one corner in each hand, that's your proverbial armor. It's a black trash bag, it's opaque. Now I want to ask you, How can you expect that prospective client to see who you are, what you want, your intent, your heart, your desires, what you can provide for them, the boundaries with which you're willing to support that, how you can provide solutions in their world that's going to really amplify? How can they, how can you ever expect them to understand and receive that delivered through that opaque force field? 
How is you, as a leader, could you ever expect your team to really understand the vision, the understanding, the charisma, the energy that's connected behind it when it's being delivered through an opaque force field? And that's assuming, by the way, that the other person on the other side or persons aren't carrying their own associated armor, which is going to further dilute the message. Right. Right. And, you know, how many people have not felt understood? Right. Man, my intent is this, but I'm getting criticized for this. The world will never judge you based on your intent. They will always base, judge you based on your actions. But our actions are often delivered through armor and received through armor. So how are we supposed to know the real intent? You remind me of a quote. I can't remember where I'm taking it, but it, it was a paradigm shift for me. When you're born, you look like your parents. When you pass, you look like your choices. Yeah, that's what powerful. That, what does that mean to you? Uh, well, one of my core lessons from my dad that's also evolved into another lesson. My dad, this is one of the powerful things he taught me. It's interesting. He taught it to me intellectually, not by necessarily example, even sure. though he has by example as well in many situations. But it's always been this, right? No matter what, never fails. Always guaranteed in life. Every situation, you will always have a minimum of two choices, right? They both might be shitty choices. You could be held up at gunpoint and it's a matter of giving everything <laughs> over to do it or refusing to and potentially getting shot, right? Like the trade-off, it's your choice. But I genuinely, genuinely believe that we all must choose our pain or our suffering will choose us, right? And so our choices to me are not about avoiding pain. Again, it's about what are the pains I need to embrace. So that concept that I shared, just to give an example, because what does that mean to me? I can embrace the pain of hitting the gym for 30 minutes a day to ensure I avoid the suffering of aches and pains from a sedentary lifestyle and not being able to play with my kids or my grandkids when I'm 70, right? I can embrace the pain of firing my top salesperson who's contributing the most to top line growth to avoid the suffering of stagnant growth and losing all our other top talent because they were the greatest cancer in our culture, right? The list goes on. Every category of life this can exist in. And so for me, I don't want people to just live and exist in pain. That's the whole point. Right. I want you to remove the suffering because that's the stuff we can't escape. But the pain defined as it is, is short-term intermittent and a direct cause from something and alleviated once that direct cause is removed. So if we honor the actual real definition of pain, Anything that persists longer than the direct cause or lasts longer than a quick window of time while you're healing and moving through it isn't really pain. It's not even chronic pain. It's suffering. But the unavoidable truth is this. We don't want to admit that suffering exists when it's a direct result of our choices. Right. But the unavoidable precursor to change is acceptance. So until we accept the current state of things, we cannot alter them. We cannot change them. And then we inevitably feel like, we don't have choices because life at that point, we're just a victim and life is fate. We have no influence or control. Thank you for diving into that. Cause, cause you mentioned action choices that the, the choice to take action is movement. And there's a lot of lip service in the world. It's actually taking that action, making that choice. That's what yep. we're being judged on. If I understand properly, it's the truth, you know, and you know, that was, one of the elements, I don't know if we covered it yet, but the other, one of the other pillars is ownership, mm. right? Talk ownership is, is understanding that when we react in a moment, when we allow our trash to get dumped on someone else, or we trip on it and, and cause damage, part of damage is repair, right? So in my household, just two and a half years ago, we unpacked, like I said, this deep hidden element of anger that I didn't know was there. Repair was the first part of focus. Yeah. But when I went and sat with Ashley's parents, and we sat down and I told them all, like, this is what's contributed. This is how I've affected your and our, like my relationship with both of you. This is where I've kept you further away from your daughter because of my anger, my armor, my protection. Her dad, in very simple words, reinforced one of the most powerful and important lessons we're trying to teach our kids. He said, great, Brian, you talk too much. Show me. The world will never judge you based on your intent. They will always judge you based on your actions because your actions are how you demonstrate who you are and what you stand for in the world. You will always be judged by your actions. So if your actions are not in alignment with your intent because of the armor you're carrying or the trash you've not taken out, no wonder you're disconnected and not being understood in life. You go really deep 
on your podcast, Flipping the Lid. So I will put that in the show notes. I do recommend people start with the first episode. That's you. And I don't know if I heard it from you, but I'll just say it regardless. And I want to recognize you. I don't think Ashley's your other half. I think you're both each other's other whole. I think that's an important distinction. You're not better halves. You're two whole people that have co-aligned and are doing great things. Talk about flipping the lid. Talk about the first episode and why that's a good place to start. First and foremost, I just want to thank you and honor you for saying that the way that you said that. You literally gave me chills and goosebumps across (laughs) my entire body hearing you reflect that back. Because I believe it's the truth as well. I don't always describe it that way. Um, Yeah, I like to say that my wife and I have been together for 17 years, but we hid from each other for 14 And she's only felt emotionally safe with me for 12 to 18 months. We've been through a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. And I've said for years that uh, I get 100% credit for what's only 50% mine, right? And that's because I'm not naive to the fact that my wife has been a phenomenal strength, a phenomenal mirror, a phenomenal guide, a phenomenal coach, a phenomenal challenger in so many ways while always holding me in the viewpoint of seeing me for who she believed me to be even when my actions weren't demonstrating congruence in that and so we are we are we are both whole but we were not always whole why we're working so well now is i think for the first time in these last 12 18 months we actually are full whole selves and i think in the past we were only a partial version of who we were when we were together Because what happened? Well, I grew up in a household that there was a right and wrong way to do everything. Right? So when Ashley and I lived together, my conditioning with pure intent, which was just purely to help, would look something like this. Hey, have you considered loading the top rack of the dishwasher differently so that we can get more in and the dishes get cleaner? Innocent in my intent, but what does that get received as by many people? You don't know how to roll the dishes control. And I've given her a narrative that she doesn't know what she's doing and the way she does it isn't good enough. Right. And there were all these little subtle embedded pieces in our relationship. I mean, shit, laundry, like, right. Like the way laundry would be, or the way we both live, I'm very particular. I don't like clutter and mess. And she could exist in a room that a bomb went off. Sometimes I think, I know that that's not her core state of ideal, but she also, she can operate that way. We had to like really come to center. But again, the biggest piece that was lacking It didn't lack in the first six to nine months of our relationship. It only started to lack when we lived together and we couldn't escape it, Um, which was, which was truly most of the rest of the period of time. I had a dominating, angry, controlling type energy, even though that was never my intent. Right. And so she would shrink further and further into herself. And that's what led to us unpacking anger is she had told me things I'd done and contributed to her losing who she was. I lost who I was at 27. I've been trying to unpack that since, right? So the reality of it is, is in our 17 years together, we've probably only been our whole selves for 12 to 18 months. And so now we get to really benefit and leverage the partnership that we've created, how we really ebb and flow off of each other, things that we used to think were so different. We were so far apart on. We now realize the gift in that as well, because the perspectives we're hitting both bookends with almost anything we look at. And so when we can trust and surrender to that and we start to reestablish trust now, you know, I joke because I still say I get hundred percent credit for probably less than 50% mine. If I'm being honest, cause she really drives a lot. But what I'm super proud of is that we're standing alongside each other for the first time ever. And it's not about Brian or Ashley. It's about what are we producing? What are we building? What impact are we having? And even if I'm more the face, that's okay. Cause that's the natural role I play anyway. And she's one of the best operators, integrators, and executors I've ever met. So she can handle all of my deficiencies and I make up for the ones that she f- doesn't feel strong in. So we are really a partnership. The reason we had to be the first episode, and I won't go deep into the content unless you want to go there after this, but I, the I reason we were the very first episode. Listen, listen, have Ashley, her voice there involved. I, you don't have to go deep into the content because I'm telling everybody to go check it out. But please. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Um, the concept of our show literally is flipping the lid, which means we're flipping the lid inside the lives of some of the most significant and successful people who are creating impact in this world. 
right? Or people who flip the lid in their industries, who've changed some things over. And those conversations, to your point, are deep. They are real. And Fortunately, I'm facilitating them, I believe, in a way that people feel safe and protected. And so they're talking about things that many of them have never said on any other public platform, which is cool. I felt like the only way I could do that is if we led. If we flip the lid inside our lives in a formal way on the podcast. Anybody who consumes my content knows that I'm very open. I'm raw. I'm vulnerable. And people in our community know like, Shit, I could have something happen the prior night and we're turning it into a lesson already for what it means for all of us. I'm just very open at this point and it becomes really easy to live that way. But Ashley also hasn't been on camera as much. She often doesn't see the value in what she's positioning, saying, or what have you. And every time she shows up, every time she's in the community and contributes, every time she comes on a show like our episode, when she's at our retreat, every single time she is clearly my partner and my equal. I'm not leading and guiding it. It's an ebb and flow and discussion of vulnerability. And what's been cool in that is I never really envisioned it this way, but the number of people who've said something like this, man, we feel like we were sitting in your living room, listening to a private conversation between a husband and wife. Right. And like, we weren't supposed to be there. Right. Even when I say that back, it gives me chills because for us, it's so normal. And that's what we're trying to normalize is the fact that by the way, we're all the same. We all deal with these things. Every relationship, I don't care your sexual orientation, who your partner is, the age gaps. I, I don't care any of that stuff. This is about relationships, business included. And how are we facilitating the deepest level of trust connection that we can with any given person? Ideally, our most intimate relationship is the one that we can go the deepest with. And that's where Ashley and I are at. I don't think there's any layers of armor there's no hiding anymore. There's complete acceptance for both who each one of us are. And so that's what allows us to move. But that's why we had to lead with that. Now, so that you know, we're also going to be doing regular episodes together. We don't know the cadence yet, but we're scheduled to record next week. It'll probably be episode 20 again or uh, for, for our next one. But it's like we want to continue to flip the lid and bring people in because this isn't just the one time thing, right? It's regular and consistent. And so if we're unpacking what's happening in our business and our life, regularly on flip the lid it it just gives people permission to feel and say things and words to articulate and understand their own experience in a way that they may not otherwise and so you know that aligns with our goal because that alleviates suffering beautiful flipping the lid it's in the show notes this is not a promotion endorsement webinar i'm a listener i love what you're doing you mentioned community I'm a member of that community. Talk a little bit about that. We're short on time here, but I, I want to give yeah, space to talk about the community because I think it's incredible things you're doing here. Thank you. Um, you know, when I moved into this space full time in 2020, I'd had my business running side by side for five years. And in 2020, when I brought it there, the focus was really just traditional around speaking and one-to-one -one coaching. And and I'm I'm not inexpensive. I'm a high ticket coach, consultant, but I add a lot of value into organizations, but we've also had this mission to impact over a billion lives as quickly as possible. And so what does that do? If all I have is high ticket offers, I mean, the least expensive offer I had for about two years was a thousand dollars, right? That's a lot of money for a lot of people. And I don't say that with judgment. I say it as truth, right? And so many people in this space who are trying to create impact, even the messaging and narrative is like, chase the people who have money, right? But like my buddy Brad Lee said on flipping the lid, he's like, the people who have money don't need my help, right? In the same way, those who don't do. And so for me, I was like, okay, we didn't have community. We didn't have a broader place for people to go. And we didn't have a low or lower dollar option for people to engage in a way that they could get meaningful transformation, meaningful transference of knowledge and wisdom and deep connection within a trusted space. And I felt like we had the ability to, to facilitate that. So. That's what we've built over the last nine months. We've had 60 plus ish people come in and through it. We've not really marketed it effectively. It's kind of like an invitation type thing. But at the same time, the core group of 15 to 20 that have been there and show up regularly and consistently continues to grow. And those relationships deepen. 
And it's really cool when people show up and they're like, every time I walk out of this call, even if I'm not one getting hot seat coaching, even if the topic at first didn't seem like it was relevant, every time I realize that it's hitting me exactly where I need it in exactly the right moment. And so I'm just trying to surrender to that and, and facilitate and guide it based on my intuition and direction with the group. But it's inclusive and it's only $44 a month right now. And the reason it's only $44 a month, it's the low or very low barrier of entry for people to get access to the help they need. Right. So the community will likely change in structure going forward in some things, but our focus on still making sure that we have offers for even those who can't afford it is really, really core to who we're going to continue to be moving forward. It's funny. I'm just one person. So this is me reflecting, but I'm not a huge fan of one-to-one -one coaching in cases yeah. there are budgetary limitations. But when I get together with a group, a tribe of like-minded people unpacking similar things, similarities, I learn so darn much just learning from the other people than if I were to just sit down and talk about myself for an hour. Yeah. That's one thing I really gained so much value realizing that Joe or Jill down the road going through the exact same stuff as me just yeah. in possibly slightly different ways and i really love that um i close out with the rapid fire round you and i neither of us are very rapid fire so take your time with these but these are just going to be random questions i generally have a bunch of silly ones like coffee or tea on my cheat sheet but i'm just going to make these up off the top of my head awesome make them up bro let's go um, what 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 have you been flipping the lid and taking out as of lately what are you working on <laughs> uh, that's a really good question. Um, <laughs> get a rapid fire round. <laughs> I'll give you a 20 no, you, minute you question. Did. It's, a, it's a great <laughs> question. And, and here's the thing I'm, I'm, uh, just because of other parties that are involved, I'm not going to talk about the most relevant one, but what I will yeah, talk about don't. is even in the last six months, one of the things that I've had to unpack and my wife is still unpacking for her and I still have moments. I'm trying to be honest. I did not have a good, healthy relationship with money for a lot of years. Right. Though I've made a lot of it, though I've grown and sold businesses, though I can see it and understand it. I also have some pretty deep trash around narratives that are tied to money and talking about money and what it means and all this stuff that's taken me years to work through. And so just this year, I mean, shit, I'll say it on your podcast because it's the truth. January and February this year, when we burned everything to the ground last year, when we realized we were out of alignment, we didn't have some of the congruent solutions we wanted for those you know, non high paying clients that we had some businesses that weren't really going in the direction that we wanted. What did it do when we burned it all down? We tried to wrap it all up with a pretty bow as quickly as we could while establishing a new foundation. A lot of the things that I do that create growth in my world took a way back seat. And so, because we had to rebuild. So what did that mean? January and February of this year, we had less revenue each month individually and combined than I had had in any other month in my business in the last eight years and in any of my businesses for the last 20, January and February this year, right? While I'm in the best place in my life, in my relationship with my kids, with my health, with my, right, all these things. And so even that was part of the lesson of surrender. And I was having a conversation with a buddy on a phone and outlining all these things that I'm working through, all the progress we've made around anger. My kids don't even remember they had an angry dad anymore. Like that is one of the greatest wins I could ever have, right? That we caught it early enough that that's not even their experience. Yet I'm getting caught up on the fact that the external number that I've measured myself against for so many years, which was purely a financial scoreboard, yeah. wasn't where I wanted it to be, felt it needed to be. And so I, I really had to sit with that. And my buddy reflected back. He's like, you realize that the only variable that's not headed in the direction that you want after everything you've been trying to build for the last 10 years is the money. And that's just a function of time and your relationship with it. Mm. And it allowed me to really center in the present around all of what I did have in front of me, all of where we've come. But yeah, it's a great question. I mean, here's the reality. I'm, I'm known as the garbage man. I'm known as the heart surgeon without a blade. I'm known at being able to do this to help people out. But I never claim to be perfect and I never claim to have it all figured out. And the reality of it is, is I'm just like everyone else. I just might be further along in my understanding of self around these topics than some others. And that's why people lean in for our help. We'll close with the two parter, Brian. Collectively, you and Ashley, you mentioned like the, the wanting to impact a billion lives. 
tell me a little bit more about what this vision looks like, what you're working on, like how is this going to be possible and how can we help you? Thank you for that question. In particular, the last part of that question. Uh, I really That's appreciate That's the most that. important part. It is. And, um, and, and so I'll try to be really direct with that. Um, Please. I, I believe that moved people move people. You know, we've all heard the statement, hurt people, hurt people. And I think there's a lot of hurt people hurting a lot of people right now. Sure. Um, what I recognize is that a billion lives impacted will not be ever going to happen one-to-one -one with me. And I likely will not directly impact a billion people, but I can move as many as possible. And part of the reason that we're going to a more one-to-many structure is just for that reason, because to your point, there's often so much more power and the collective wisdom and the amount of time we can compress decades into days when we're actually working with a collective energetic group of people that are pulling in the same direction, who are being willing and open to go in places, it has a ripple effect far greater than anything else that I could touch. So, you know, one of my good buddies is David Meltzer, and he always says, if I empower a thousand people to empower a thousand people, you know, do the math and, and I'm there at a billion. And I, I don't look at it so linear and so transactional. And I don't mean that to say anything bad about David. I love him. I have a show with him every week. I, I have respect for him and the way it worked. For me, I don't know that I'm ever going to know if we hit it. Sure. From an external measurement print standpoint. But I do believe that someday I'm going to wake up and be able to reflect back on my life and know that we did it and that we did have that type of profound impact. The, the reason a billion exists is because of the amount of people I think are required to actually have transformation and growth in our society and our systems and our people. It needs to be enough of a sample size. So what's the best way you can help me? Okay. I'm going to say two really low hanging fruit pieces for everyone. If you listen to this conversation or any conversation I've ever had on any podcast, including my own, or you have listened to any piece of content that we've ever released and it resonated with you, it landed with you. I don't give two shits about the vanity metrics. I don't care if you copy the link and text it to somebody so it doesn't actually get brought into the algorithm, but I would ask you to move it through the world. If it moved you, move it through the world so it has a chance to move someone else. And so that only happens through likes, comments, shares, right? Does that help the algorithm if you do it on the platform? Yeah, but I'm not playing that game. I'm just trying to have the reach be as far as possible. Um, so that would be one. Brian, Please like, Brian, comment, share on anything. It happens through words too. It happens through just having totally. this conversation totally. with people. Like beyond all the likes, comments, and shares, totally. I love them. But if you go and you talk about this with someone... Thank you for bringing it back to the most simple, because that's the reality. If you are moved by something and your perspective changes, your world changes instantly. Yeah. And people around you will feel it if you allow yourself to embody that message and live within it. So thank you. Yes. It is as simple as even talking about it. I was talking about the vanity metrics because I think it's important that people understand my intent. Yes. I'm not trying to drive it from that standpoint. Right. And your example brought that even more clearly. Um, the other one, honestly, is that flipping the lid. I'm going to say we need as much help as we can get there, right? If there are people that you want on the show that you think I can tell a story that I can unpack to get more truth around even some of the bigger names that exist and many of the big names that have been on the show already, like, tell me, push it, it give me an example, give me a path, because I want to also be telling the stories that want to be consumed and want to be heard. But likes, I mean, ratings and reviews on that are also significantly meaningful for us because as we find new people finding the show... The consistency and congruence amongst those who've already consumed it only further supports and validates it. So, you know, those are all the places I'd say that are low hanging fruit that you could help me today. But the reality of it is, I also know that anything that helps me helps all of you because it only perpetuates the message even further and it normalizes these conversations in a way that it's accessible to all of us. I love this. I've got plenty of suggestions if you want to ask me, but anyone listening at home can go check out Flipping the Lid and be like, this piece seems to be missing. I think this person would fit the the narrative as well. So do that for Brian. I will say, and it's in the show notes, reaching out to Brian and Ashley, like you will get a response and you will have a conversation. You're not going to be talking to a chat bot. Like you guys are actually having conversations with everyone, which is really difficult and might not always be the case, but right now yeah. it is. 
and take advantage of that. Take advantage of the personability here. So, Brian, you, I said we might run long. We made sure we didn't have a hard deadline. I'm happy we ran a little bit long because I don't think a second was wasted other than me talking about this right now. Let's close out on a high note. And I appreciate you coming on, man. We got to do around three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. As long as, a, as, as many as necessary, brother. I, I, I welcome any opportunity to connect and have a conversation with you. I appreciate how you navigate this. I appreciate your heart in creating it and wanting to continue to push the envelope in terms of showing others what's possible through the guests you bring in and the questions you ask. I'm grateful, my friend. Thank you for the opportunity.